Oh, okay. Hi, Kev. All right, here we are, folks, and uh, I'm going to do uh, a little technical, technical tech tip. Allie Pierce Scuba, technical tech tip. That'd be a tech tech tip, wouldn't it? Anyway, here we go. Some of you have been asking, how does a piston regulator work? And I got to be honest with you, if you're not if you're not into hydraulics and, and understand pneumatics and, and mechanically engineered, mechanically inclined, then it, it can be difficult to understand. So let me give you a very simple, very simple explanation of how a piston regulator works. And that's appropriate because piston regulators, by their very nature, are very simple. As a matter of fact, this is a piston regulator here that I was just using, and I think I can show you one of the biggest advantages of piston regulators. One wrench. A big one <clears throat> and you take that cap off of the regulator dump out the spring pull out the piston <clears throat> and there you go if you discount the piston or the spring if you get rid of the spring which you don't really need anyway piston regulator has one moving part now there are very few machines in the world that only have one moving part. And the ones that do have one moving part are usually considered the most reliable for an obvious reason. There's only one part. Only one part that can go break or go wrong. And this particular part in a piston rig is quite substantial. It's a big heavy piece of material. And, and any other type of regulator, and there are, there are more than just two. A lot of you, you know there's pistons and diaphragms, there are more than that. But in any type of regulator, scuba regulator specifically we're talking about, any other regulator has a lot of parts. If I took apart a comparable diaphragm regular, we'd have about nine parts laying in front of me to do the same job as this one part. So which is more reliable? You think about it. And some of those nine parts are not very solid, not, they're, they're tiny. So one of the advantages, and I don't want to get into that discussion of which is better, diaphragm and piston. We've done that a dozen times. Just look back over my tech tips, and you can not only read my thoughts and some information about them, but you can read all, all the comments from various people who are in love with a particular type of regulator, which is kind of silly because you should always be open to ideas, open to learning, open to understanding, and, and open to suggestions. Um, I'm, I'm a very loyal fan of certain things, and I wouldn't change, I wouldn't buy another brand, no matter what. But I know the advantages of the other brands, I just choose to ignore them. So, <clears throat> anyway. Let's get back on topic here, okay? <laughs> How does a piston work? How does this thing actually do its job? Well, let's explain. I have made a simple diagram here, a very simple diagram, that shows a piston regulator. Now, we're talking the first stage only, piston regulator first stage. And the first thing we need to establish is what does a piston regulator need to do? What is its function? What's the job it's supposed to accomplish? It's the same job that any scuba regulator has to accomplish. And that is, take air from the tank, and this right here represents the top of the tank valve, this square right here. That's the top of the tank valve. If you're looking down at it, it's square. That's the tank valve. Take the air coming from that tank valve, which is coming out at 3,000 psi and going into the regulator, and reduce that air to the proper intermediate pressure to be delivered to the second stage where you breathe. And the proper intermediate pressure is about 150 PSI. So basically what we need to do, or what a, what a regulator, any regulator, piston or diaphragm, needs to do, its main function is to take 3,000 PSI, reduce it to 150 PSI, and deliver it to you through a hose. That's its job. How does it do that? How does the piston do that? Well, fortunately, I have right here, sorry, Kevin, zoom back out there, but I have right here, just to convince you, just to prove to you that, that what I'm telling you is, is, is so simple, is the truth. This is what's called a cutaway. So this is another piston regulator. And you can, you can see that, Kevin? And I've had a machinist actually cut it away, so you can open this up, <clears throat> just as I did over there, just a minute ago. And this one, you can actually take the cap off again, there's the spring, there's the body. You can see there's nothing else in the body. Nothing in there, right? There's the spring, which we don't even need, and there's the piston. And this is a, this is a more advanced, a more sophisticated model than that very simple one I have over there. That regular, by the way, is about 60 years old. This, this is quite new. This is only about 35 years old. <laughs> there's the same piston. They're virtually identical. They have a, a seat on the bottom, a rubber or silicone seat on the end. Can you see that? Let's zoom in my hands here for a minute, Kev. And you see they also have an O-ring 
part way up. You see that one? Then they have a big old ring around the head. And they have a hole right through the middle. Yeah, that hole <clears throat> goes down through the top of the piston, right down, and comes out down here somewhere. I can't see it. You see the hole right down there at the very bottom. See that tiny hole there? Can I have a hole still? So you can see the hole. Yeah, just trust me on this one. There it goes in there and comes out down there. Below the, okay, so how does this all work? All right, let's get rid of those, that junk and let me explain. And you're simply going to have to bear with me here, folks. It's a simple diagram. I'm trying to follow along with this simple explanation, and I think you'd be amazed at, at how this works. The, the, the principle is simple. It's the same principle that allows your service station to lift your 3,000-pound car on a hoist using a compressor that only has 110 PSI. Service station compressors only go to about 110, 120 PSI, but they can lift your 3,000-pound car way up in the air. It's the same principle, except it's used in a piston regulator in scuba. Here we go. Watch. As I said earlier, you put your regulator onto a scuba valve. Here's the scuba valve. And you turn on the valve, and 3,000 PSI of air comes through. Now, the air goes through this little raised seat. There's a little raised seat, a little circular seat. Okay? And it goes through that seat, and it comes to the piston. This red on here indicates that's that silicone seat on the bottom edge of the piston. And, of course, 3,000 PSI, guess what happens? The piston gets the heck out of the way. You're darn right it does. It pushes up out of the way. Yeah, 3,000 PSI, I would move too. So the piston moves up, up in the chamber, moves out of the way. Consequently, air goes through that chamber and fills that chamber into here. And some air, of course, goes out through the hose, uh, through here. This is the hose that leads to your second stage. So you're getting air. Good. That's the whole idea, right? But you've got 3,000 PSI. You don't want 3,000 PSI. You only want 150 PSI. What shuts it off at 150? That is the question. We want this to stop at 150. And then when we suck air out of the second stage, we want it to open again. So we get more air at 150. How does it do that? Well, it's really very simple. Watch. Not only does air <clears throat> come out and into this chamber here, it's called the intermediate chamber, but air also goes through that little hole in the side of the piston, right here, you see it? And it goes up through the middle of the piston. Remember I told you, you got a hole right through it. Comes up into this chamber up here. There's another chamber up here. And it fills up that chamber. Now both of these chambers are sealed by O-rings. O-ring right there, red goes right around the top of the piston. There's an O-ring here, that one that goes around the middle of the piston. So if you look at the, at, at the piston and think about the piston and, and, and the hole in the side, air goes right through, this is what the regulator looks like when you first turn on the air. So what happens? Well, air goes to your regulator, air goes to the top. And the air pressure at 3,000 PSI starts to build. It builds up and it builds up and it builds up. And when it reaches 150 PSI, which is what you want, the piston moves down and shuts off the airflow at 150, automatically. How does it do that? No, there's no dwarf in there. No, it's not magic. It might seem like magic, but it isn't. Watch. Go over here. Here's that piston again over here. Same piston. You see it? It's got a silicone seat on the bottom, a little silicone seat that seals. There's the O-ring. O-ring around the top, and a hole right through the middle. 3,000 PSI. 3,000 PSI is pushing on this little seat. That little seat is about this big. Let's pretend. Let's pretend it's this big. Air goes up through the piston and pushes down on the top of the piston. The top of the piston is this big. There's the top of the piston. Let's pretend. Let's pretend that the top of the piston is one square inch. I'll put one inch. This is how you show one square inch. The top of the piston has an area of one square inch. Big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Remember, when we talk about pressure, we talk about PSI, pounds per square inch. So this is 3,000 per square inch. It's not 3,000 pounds of force. It's not like the weight of your car. It's 3,000 PSI per square inch. Now, if the top of the piston is one square inch, and the bottom down here is very, very small, there'll be more force pushing down. Let me explain once again. Here's the bottom 
of the piston. Let's assume that this bottom is 1 20th of a square inch. That's pretty close, actually. If you take a look at that piston, I'm going to hold it up again here. Here it is. There's the top of the piston. Let's call that one square inch. And there's the bottom of the piston with that rubber seal on the bottom. And it would take about 20 of those, if you look at it quickly, about 20 of those little ones to cover that top one, wouldn't it? So the bottom is about 1 20th the size of the top of the piston. Okay, you ready? Here's the math. So you've got 3,000 PSI pushing up. 3,000 pounds per square inch. But the bottom of the piston is only 1 20th of a square inch. Therefore, the upward force, the force pushing it up, is only 1 20th of 3,000. You following this, you math experts? What's a 20th of 3,000? 150. That's right. So there's actually an upward force pushing up of 150 pounds of force pushing up. Okay. The pressure builds up at the top, and it builds up, and it builds up. And when it gets to 150 PSI, pounds per square inch, it pushes the piston back down. Why? Because 150 PSI pushing down on one square inch is a downward force of 150 pounds. So you have a downward force of 150 pounds and an upward force of 150 pounds. The piston stops moving when the pressure continues to increase and it gets to 151 PSI on the top. It closes the piston. So you suck on it. The air goes out of here. It goes out of the top chamber. The 3,000 pushes it back up. You stop sucking on it. Pressure builds up at the top to 150. The 150 pushes down and shuts off the flow. Suck, stop. Suck, stop. Suck, stop. Let me go over that, that simple diagram, and see if it doesn't start to make sense. Now, I want to make one more thing clear. Most divers think that when they suck on the regulator, the first stage opens and gives them air. And when they stop sucking, the first stage closes and stops here. That's the theory. And I suppose that to some extent in practice that's true, but not really. This happens so quickly, and it is so sensitive, that as you start to suck on the regulator and the pressure drops even by 1 PSI, let's say it drops down to 149 PSI, at 149, now the 3,000 PSI overcomes the 149 and opens instantly and delivers more air. Well, you didn't want that much air. You're still just starting to draw breath. So the pressure quickly jumps to 151 and it closes. You're still breathing. You're still drawing in, which means it drops to 149, so it opens. And it catches up and it closes. It happens so fast that it oscillates. This thing actually goes up so fast you can't see it happening. That's right. But, point is, it delivers air at 150. It's the same with the diaphragm. They oscillate. Maybe sometimes you have heard a diver inhale and you get a whistle. Every time they inhale. They don't hear a whistle when they exhale. That's oscillations. You know you take a wine glass, let your finger go around the top? Oscillations. It's the same thing in a regular. They can oscillate because they're moving so quickly. However, in theory, you draw, it goes up, you stop drawing, it goes down. And there you understand. Here's that diagram. I might get Kevin to make that diagram bigger and you can play with it with a pencil or a pen and see if it makes sense to you. But the point is, it can't be any simpler. One moving part. There it is. No levers, no buttons, no Velcro, no zippers. <laughs> it works perfectly every time. Anyway, we'll talk again a little bit more about regulators, diaphragm, ray. How do you adjust a piston? How do you adjust this? There's no way to adjust it. There's no screws. Well, there are ways to adjust it, which we'll talk about later. Oh, and something else. As you go deeper, you want, you want higher pressure. How does that work? We'll get back to it. You work on this for a little while. Make sure this is clear in your mind, and we'll talk about it some more. Alec Pierce, scuba, tech tips. Hope you enjoyed that.